Well, good morning. Welcome to the branch. We're glad you're with us. Why don't we stand together as we as we sing?
God, we come before you, and sometimes all that we can muster up is just to say, God, you are good. Even when we don't fully get that and understand it, sometimes when we don't even know that we believe it. And yet, God, we say that, we know it's true, and then we ask you to give us the faith to, to believe and trust. And so, God, as we meet here in this place with one another, with you, I pray that you would speak to us, you would change our hearts, God, make us who you created us to be, that we might see your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat, and kids can be dismissed to Branch Kids. say the devil is in the details. I think he's in the sound system, but yeah, where's the drums, right? Yeah. Well, as, as we read through the Gospels in the Bible, we see Jesus interacting in all the different spaces. If you've been with us or listened over the last couple of weeks, we've been walking through the four spaces of belonging. We talked about public space and then social space, and today we're looking at this idea of personal space. And if we're becoming more like Jesus every day, then we should seek to make meaningful connections in all of these spaces. As we've talked about um, public space and social space, we've, we've said that uh, public space is the place where we're, we're seen and where we see other people. Last week, we talked about the fact that, um, that in social space, uh, we make ourselves available to one another. Public space is the place where people may come in as strangers, but when they're seen, uh, they're no longer strangers to us. And we begin uh, to, to learn and understand some about ourselves in these different spaces. We learn about other people as well. Uh, we talked last week about the fact that in social space, um, we learn the details of people's life, that we uh, get to know their birthdays and, and where they live and some other significant details about them. And we move beyond just simply seeing people and really knowing people. Um, knowing them a little bit more deeply than just calling them casual Facebook friends, right? Personal space, which we're talking about today, is, is the space that we see Jesus inhabit most often with his disciples, of whom he had 12. And really, we'd say that personal space is that space that's made up of people from, you know, like 10 to 12 or 12 to 15 People, Dan White Jr. and J.R. Woodward in their book, The Church's Movement, say this smaller space moves us beyond the intellectual assimilation of ideas and into a reflective and responsive space. When we make the decision to enter into personal space with people, we're not only allowing themselves and allowing ourselves to be seen, but we also say, hey, I'm making myself available and then when we move into personal space, we're actually saying, hey, I'm making myself accountable to other people. And I'm making myself vulnerable in some ways when I make myself accountable. When we talk about personal space, the two words that we can often use to describe how community is nurtured and how it grows is our presence and proximity. That we grow together as people uh, when we spend time being present with one another and being proximate, being close to one another. Jesus shows that this in, this, uh, in his relationship with his disciples, he shows this to us and demonstrates what that looks like as together they establish this rule and rhythm of life together, that they tracked together every day with one another, especially the disciples, uh, for three years, they did life together, which is kind of the, the modern vernacular of what that looks like. In a way that um, they, they weren't selling something, they weren't trying to use it as cliche, but they really legitimately said, we're sharing our lives with 
one another, and it means something. There's accountability there. And if we avoid personal space, then we're really saying, hey, I am not comfortable with accountability. And frankly, we live in a culture where that probably can be said to be true, that people are not always hungry for accountability. I mean, we can look um, at every, I think, faction of our, our culture and see that there are people who really struggle with accountability. White and Woodward also write in their book that the smaller the group is, the more we expect from each other in that space. We expect follow through on our promises, consistency in our presence, accountability for our actions, and vulnerability with our words. And so as we look at this idea of personal space this morning, um, looking at uh, an account in Mark chapter 14 where Jesus shares that personal space with his disciples. So if you have a Bible, you can turn to Mark chapter 14. Actually consider doing uh, communion again today since that's the account that we're reading. But um, Jesus is celebrating the Passover with his disciples. And in verse 12, uh, we begin uh, to read this account. Mark writes, On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? And so he sent two of his disciples, telling them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters, The teacher asks, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He'll show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. And the disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them. And so they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me. It's one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. And while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly I tell you, I'll not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they'd sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. You know, here the disciples are coming together, and it wasn't unusual for them to necessarily share a meal together, but this was a special meal. They were celebrating the Passover together, and Jesus sent them ahead. They, they acquired this upstairs room, and, and there they were. And, and the practice of eating back in Jesus' day was very different than the practice of eating in our day. You know, we uh, like to sit nicely at a table. I mean, uh, I'll be honest, that doesn't always happen in my house. Sometimes we do it around the coffee table, but for the most part, if we're putting our best foot forward, we're, we're gathered around a table, and we've got knives and forks and plates and whatever. Well, well, the disciples, they're all reclining around the table. This wasn't like a, a three-foot high table. This was a, a table down here, and they didn't have chairs. They were basically reclining on each other. You think it's messy when you're not sitting up. Think about what it's like when you're not sitting up with other people around you, right? And there they are reclining. And there's this posture of comfort. I mean, I I went the other night to a restaurant with friends and I laughed because someone took my spot, which is always the spot that doesn't have my back towards the door, right? Um, And some of us have a very particular way that we sit and recline at the table and these disciples they were making themselves vulnerable in this space but think about the level of comfort that they felt with one another to be able to kind of lay on each other and to relax in this personal space The people with whom we enter personal space are people with whom we've made a conscious decision to go deeper with. We said this about 
about social space, that in social space we put our best foot forward. It's almost like speed dating, you know, for friendship, that we say, okay, I'm going to see what I find out about you here, and I decide whether or not I'm willing to kind of go to that next step with you. The disciples spent their days together following Jesus, witnessing his miracles, hearing his teaching, and there was a bond there that had developed with them. They felt comfortable with one another in personal space. And as they gathered there to celebrate the Passover together, they entered that space with a level of vulnerability, and and right out of the gate, you know, Jesus doesn't pull any punches. He tells them right away, hey, guess what? One of you is, is going to betray me. And I think the posture of the disciples in that moment we see in verse 18 and 19, Jesus tells them, and it says they were saddened in verse 19, and one by one they said to him, surely you don't mean me. Again, we, I think, live in a blame culture where instead of being reflective and, and self-aware, we say, well, surely it wasn't me. It must have been you. But I appreciate the way that the disciples don't take that posture. The moment Jesus says, hey, one of you is going to betray me, instead of looking around and seeing who it's going to be, like you're playing Clue or something, right? No, they say, is it me? Is it me? A- am I the one who's going to betray Jesus? There's no blaming. There's no covering up. They're legitimately asking themselves that question. And I wonder in our own lives, in, where do we find those spaces where we act like that? Where there's no blaming, there's no pointing fingers, but we really stop and we ask ourselves, like, am I, am I aware of myself? Where do we need, where do we go where we don't feel like we need to put a mask on? Where we don't have to pretend that everything's okay or, or put our kind of social media face forward? Where can we go where we're not blaming other people and where we can honestly ask ourselves questions? And who are the people that allow us to do that around them? You know, who are the people with whom we've built so much trust that we're not afraid when they see what's behind the curtain, when they see the things that, the chinks in the armor, so to speak. There's no fear of judgment, and we're not afraid to be ourselves. As they continue their meal, Jesus assures them that it's one of them. And the disciples, they come to this space with accountability asking themselves, asking Jesus, asking each other that question. You know, again, I, I don't think we do accountability as a culture very well. I mean, not, not too long ago in the neighborhood where, where we live, there was some damage done to the neighborhood, and, and apparently there was footage caught of the people who had done it, and even when they were approached, um, they didn't want to pay for it. I don't know all the truth of that, but I thought to myself, that's not beyond the realm of belief and possibility that that would happen. Because we don't like to be accountable for things. You know, ask a politician to be accountable to the, for the things that they've done wrong, and they'll always find some way around it. And so I, I wonder how we're doing in being accountable for our own lives. That word accountable, it comes and has its root in the word account, which is generally associated with money. That we're making sure that everything's even up, that things balance out. It means giving an adequate answer for something. Where are the places in our lives where we are accountable? And which are the relationships where that happens? My experience is that accountability comes much, much easier when there's a relationship there. When people with whom I have no relationship start to try to hold me accountable, I buck up really quickly. I I don't like that at all. Because I'm not so sure that they really have my best interest in mind because we haven't forged this relationship with trust and honesty and other things. So, Where are those places in our life where this is happening? 
I've quoted Michael Frost often saying that the table is the great equalizer in relationships. And I, I believe that when we sit down and when we share a meal together with other people, something happens. We, we put aside our pretenses. We're, we're not afraid to, to show ourselves a little bit more deeply. And one of the reasons why we started our around the table dinners in the fall was to create an atmosphere where that could happen where we weren't afraid to, to go a little bit deeper with people than just in certain social or public spaces. And next month we'll be kicking those off again and encouraging people to sign up to say, hey, I want to get to know people a little bit deeper. I want to see them a little bit more deeply and let them see me. And I want to see if there's a possibility and a potential for accountability in certain places. Jesus and his disciples, they celebrate this Passover meal together and then they sing a hymn and, and then they go away. And we know what happens next if we're familiar with the story. They go to the Garden of Gethsemane and Jesus prays away from his disciples. They fall asleep on him multiple times and then finally the guards come and take him away. Jesus is tried He's crucified, he's put in the tomb, and three days later, Jesus rises again. And in that space, I wonder if having had that experience with Jesus helped to sustain the disciples through what would happen over the next few days. What would have happened had the disciples not had that time with Jesus leading up to his arrest, his, his trial, and his crucifixion? And I think for us, too, as we look at the disciples, and they didn't all handle, handle it masterfully either, but as we look at how the disciples journeyed through those next few days together, do we let what happens in our own personal space propel us into the other spaces in our life? As we experience certain things, you know, yeah, there's this, the, the old adage about what, what happens in, in Vegas stays in Vegas. What happens in personal space stays in personal space, but not completely and fully. Yes, the things that we say and share together with one another, we should keep that absolutely there in personal space. But what happens to us in that space as we interact with one another, we shouldn't leave it there. We should let it propel us into that other space. I think that's what the disciples did. I think as they experienced intimacy with one another and accountability with one another, they brought that out. They didn't start sharing all the, the juicy secrets that were shared in that space, but what happened to them in that space, they didn't leave it there. They brought it with them. The transformation that they experienced, they brought it out. And here's the thing, as we experience those connections and relationships with other people, we can't force anybody to make connections. We can't. You know, Joseph Myers, in his book, The Search to Belong, he, he says this. He says, historically, churches have promoted personal and intimate as the preferred spaces to belong. But if a person belongs to God in a public or social way, is it up to us to correct it? Is it wrong to help people grow their public relationships without requiring them to grow it closer in a different space? And I think so often we, as the church, have, have pushed and said, hey, oh, you've got to have personal relationships and personal space. You need to have intimate relationships and intimate space, but we can't force people to do that. We can create spaces and opportunities for people to do that, but only the Holy Spirit is going to move somebody to that place. And I think that's part of what happens to us. Those of us who say, hey, I'm willing to go and enter into personal space with other people, when God does a work in us there, I think we bring it out to other people. We show them in almost a, in, in almost a way to say, hey, look what you're missing when you're missing personal space. Look, look at the benefits that you're not realizing because you're not willing to go and be accountable and be and enter into this space with one another. Look, some of us, we're not comfortable going into that space. 
We're, we say, I, you know, I don't want accountability. I don't want vulnerability. I, I don't want people to see my stuff and the skeletons in my closet. That's okay. Pray that God might help you trust other people. Trust is a powerful thing. You know, it takes years and years for us to build it up and seconds for us to lose it. And I think some people are unwilling to enter into spaces like personal space because of what's happened in the past, because they're afraid. But when we allow ourselves to go into those spaces, it's amazing what God can do, what he can do to change us and transform us. And what we experience there, we can bring out to other people. And it can be a testimony of what God does there And as we testify to what God has done for us, in us, through us, in those spaces, then it allows others to say, hey, maybe, maybe I can go enter into a personal space with other people as well, and maybe God will do similar work in me. And so what do we do with all this? First question to ask ourselves, again, like, kind of like an inventory. Where do we experience personal space in our life? Think about the different relationships you have in your life. Which ones would you say are personal space? And then ask yourself, as you identify those spaces, what kind of accountability do you experience there? Like, is it truly personal space in such that you experience uh, accountability? That you're accountable to others and others are accountable to you. And then finally, what, when you spend that time in personal space, how does your time in that personal space propel you and prepare you to go out and share that with other people? Can people see a difference in you because of the time that you've spent in personal space? Is God doing something in you through you, and to you in that personal space. Let me pray for us. Father, I, I know that trust is a powerful thing. And God, we're not always willing to, to enter into these spaces with other people. And yet, God, I know that you can do powerful things in us in these spaces. And so, Father, teach us to trust. Teach us to trust, first and foremost, you. That, God, you have our best interest in mind, that, that you want us to go deeper. But, God, may we trust you for ourselves and others as well. And may, when, when we see others who are not willing, God, just let our hearts be burdened for them that we might lift them up in prayer. We may trust that, God, you're doing a work in them regardless of whether or not they're willing to enter into those spaces. So, Father, for us in these spaces, I pray that you would do the work that you need to do and that, God, we would trust that, that your promises are true, that you are doing a work that you will complete And uh, God, may we be gracious as you are gracious to us as we interact in these spaces. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand together as we sing.
Put my faith, I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope and firm foundation, he'll never let me, I put my faith. Sing that bridge again. I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope and firm foundation. He'll never let me down. I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope and firm foundation. He'll never let me. I put my faith. God's faithfulness in all that we do. Uh, we believe at the branch that God has equipped us and created us in such a way that we're part of something bigger, and we do our best to point people towards that. Um, there's opportunities where where you can use the gifts that God's given you to um, 
spread that word about his faithfulness and uh, build the kingdom of God. We're starting our tutoring program up in a couple weeks again, Tuesday nights from 6.30 to 7.30. Still looking for tutors. Um, There are kids on the waiting uh, list that we can uh, add to Tuesday night if we can get some additional tutors. So trust me, you do not have to, uh, you know, be the, the best and the brightest mind to, to make this happen. They're mostly uh, younger kids, so don't worry if you're like, I don't want to do geometry or I don't want to do trigonometry. Um, these are mostly elementary school kids, like kindergarten, first, second, third grade. Um, so the biggest problem would probably be that silly math that they teach now, that is right. So... Um, But uh, if you have questions about it, feel free to talk to me, send me a message. Um, I'd be glad to answer that. Um, And and if you can't be here every time, um, there there are times that we need subs. Um, And if you're not even up for that, we'd love for you just to stop by and check it out and see what happens on Tuesday nights um, as we open up our space and partner with the YMCA um, to be a light in this community. Um, There's other things that are happening. You can check out our website, our Facebook page. Um, you can follow up uh, listening to past messages, watching past messages, YouTube, Spotify, our podcast, and other things as well. If you want to partner with us in any way, we would love for you to do that. Um, there's opportunities to financially partner with us online. Uh, you can check those out on the screen. Um, and however you partner with us, we are grateful for that. Thank you for, for being a part of this um, and letting God work through you and use the gifts that he's given you. And so as we go into this world, as we go into the personal spaces in our lives, may God use us and transform us as we enter into those spaces, making ourselves vulnerable, making ourselves accountable. And remember that God equips us with what we need to accomplish his will and his work. And so may we go with the authority of God the Father. May we go with the power of God the Holy Spirit. May we go in the name of God the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thanks for being here.